This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by sunscreen. Do you want to lie in the sun all day and damage coral reefs? Buy some sunscreen today. Welcome to episode 45 of the Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. It is Friday, May 14th, and we've got another fun topic for you today. You can subscribe to the Sweaty Penguin on Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Addict, wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review, and you will get a shout-out at the end of the show. The other way to get a shout-out? Join our Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll also get access to some Sweaty Penguin swag, exclusive bonus content, and more. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. The sweaty penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station, the WNET group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Today, we are talking about tea, a word that single-handedly explains why English is such a tough language to learn. Seriously, you have the letter T, you have the drink T, you have the pogo stick that five-year-olds use to hit a baseball T, you have the shirt T, if you're in Boston, the subway is the T, you have Mr. T, and if all that wasn't enough, now apparently the word T can just mean whatever you want. I was still following when spill the T referred to sharing gossip, but if people are just going to say that's T, to anything they agree with or find interesting, I think the metaphor has gone off the rails. As much as you might associate tea with curing sickness or telling coffee drinkers how much better than them you are, tea is actually far from perfect. Tea contributes to several environmental issues, from deforestation to soil erosion to plant biodiversity loss to excess pesticide use. And as climate change increases, these environmental issues are poised to worsen, the quality of tea could go down, and the actual tea plant yields themselves are under threat. Right off the bat, I should say that none of these issues mean tea is terrible and drinking it is the end of humanity. I'm not here to ruin the drink tea, I only really wanted to ruin the slang version of the word. But these issues do matter and are worth talking about because, and this surprised me, tea is really popular. In fact, across the world, 2.16 billion cups of tea are consumed every day. 2.16 billion! That's nearly a third of all the people! That's 11 times the number of users on Twitter, 28 times the number of people who watched the Seinfeld finale live, and 2.16 billion times the number of people who like candy corn. It's me. I'm the one person. And if that's not shocking enough, tea is actually the second most consumed beverage in the world, second only to water. In fact, tea has gotten so popular that there are now tea influencers. Have you heard of the dreaded China Slim Tea? This tea will have you on the toilet four days, your stomach will be in knots, turning, wishing you never bought it, wishing you never even thought you should consume it. Well, I got a box of it. Um, Mackenzie, what's the rest of this 11-minute video going to be about? If over 90,000 people have viewed this, I can't imagine we're about to watch you live on the toilet for 11 minutes, but based on your introduction, I don't see another way this can go. The fact that there are popular influencers talking tea actually says some important things. For one, it shows tea is popular with a young demographic, which is actually true. According to the Tea Association of the USA, 87% of American millennials drink tea. If young people love the drink, seeing it threatened by climate change is even greater cause for concern. But it also means people are interested in their tea, want to learn more about it, and interact with other tea drinkers. You might even say they've formed a community. And since consumer preference can be a driver of environmental change, the fact that tea drinkers engage with influencers and each other means there's easy potential for people to learn about these environmental issues, discover environmentally friendlier options, and ultimately push the tea industry in the right direction. So today, we'll cover what environmental and social issues intersect with tea, how climate change is beginning to disrupt the industry, and where we might go from here. But first, where does tea come from? 
Tea comes from the leaves of a type of small tree called Camellia sinensis, or more commonly, a tea plant. Tea plants require tropical climates with lots of water and drainage. They're native to Southeast Asia, but are now grown all over the world. China and India are still the leaders by far, but countries like Kenya, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Turkey, and dozens more are involved. Each time a plant creates a new shoot, the new leaves, known as the flush, are hand-picked. Since tea harvest technology is more more expensive than human labor, tea leaves are picked by hand. In warmer regions, the plants create leaves all year round, but in cooler climates, tea harvests may only last from April to September. Though tea leaves can grow into larger trees, they're typically trimmed to four to six feet to make it easier to pick. Different types of tea are distinguished by how long the tea leaves are left to oxidize between harvesting and drying. Similar to an apple, which turns brown after sitting out a couple weeks, or a banana, which is green for a bit, turns yellow for about 40 seconds, and then immediately becomes black and mushy, tea leaves change in color, aroma, flavor, and strength as they're exposed to oxygen post-harvest. These plants actually undergo a chemical reaction, where the oxygen causes a release of polyphenol oxidase, which creates a new chemical inside the plant that reacts with amino acids to produce melanin pigments. That oxidation process creates the six main types of tea, white, yellow, green, oolong, black, and pu'er, which actually goes through a longer process called fermentation, where the leaves are treated with a fungal or bacterial colony and broken down. Now that we know how tea leaves are grown and harvested, let's dive into some of the environmental concerns. We'll get to climate change in a moment, but before that, we have to talk about monocropping and monoculture. As we covered in the corn episode a couple months ago, monocropping is the practice of growing the same plant year after year in the same field, and monoculture is the practice of only growing that one plant at any given time. Like many agricultural commodities, tea relies on monocropping and monoculture. Culture, and that leads to a number of issues. For one, pests thrive in monocultures. Imagine you had your choice between two buffets. One had a bunch of random dishes you'd never tried before, and the other was just a long row of trays filled to the brim with bacon. Since the second one guarantees everything you eat will be fantastic because, let's face it, bacon is the best food on the planet, any reasonable person would pick the all-bacon buffet over the mystery one. Similarly, when faced with the choice between all tea leaves or a bunch of mystery plants, an insect that loves tea leaves like the tea scale or the chili thrips are going to invade the all tea area. And as a result of that increased pest presence, tea drinkers are forced to contend with this. The guests are surprised to hear something may be steeping in their brew. It's going to not cross a lot of people's minds that there may be something else other than just the tea leaf in there. But just wait till they hear our results. Nearly all the teas we test have pesticide residue, half of them with amounts exceeding maximum levels set in Canada. You didn't know there was something other than a tea leaf in your cup? Where did you think the water came from? But in all seriousness, that tea drinker has a point. A lot of people drink tea thinking of it as healthy and cleansing, but it's actually very often contaminated with pesticide residue. It's like finding out your warm milk has poison ivy in it, or that Entourage has Michael Phelps in it. Now, as we've discussed before, not all pesticides are necessarily bad for you, so hearing someone just say pesticide residue isn't nearly specific enough. But this study did find some bad ones, most prominently DDT, which we have a whole episode on, and endosulfan, which is a DDT-like pesticide that has come under global scrutiny for its negative human health effects. And one of the brands tested in this study actually had the residues of 22 different pesticides. Again, it's not so much an issue with tea itself as it is an issue with monocultures, where farmers have to resort to heavy applications of dangerous pesticides to deter pests from the tea leaf buffet. So it's not anything inherently bad about tea, just the way tea agriculture is currently done. And monocropping and monoculture don't just lead to excessive pesticide use. Tea plantations essentially must wipe out every other plant and animal species on the land, leading to a loss of biodiversity and the decline of species such as the lion-tailed macaw in India and the Horton Plains slender loris in Sri Lanka, both of which are on the IUCN's red list of endangered species. Monocropping and monoculture also lead to nutrient depletion in the soil, since the ratio of nutrients in the soil 
and the ratio of nutrients that the plants uptake will inevitably be different. And in a 2013 research project from the University of Nairobi, conducted on the Chinga tea growing area of Kenya, it was found that for every extra acre planted with tea, 0.889 acres of forest was lost. Other studies have found similar results in the eastern Himalayan region, and given that tea grows in tropical climates, it makes sense that tea would be replacing forests, as opposed to replacing something less essential, like grasslands or youth lacrosse fields. This deforestation alters the natural flow of water, increases soil erosion leading to the loss of wetland habitats and the pollution of rivers and lakes, and in some cases, could even contribute to climate change. Tea is a bit of a special case since tea plants are trees, so they do absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but if you were to cut down, say, an old growth forest and put a tea plantation there, the amount of carbon you'd release is way more than the amount of carbon you'd store. But while tea could impact climate change, in a much bigger way, climate change impacts tea. I was teaching an English girl to make tea up there. And on her little estate, we actually found the uva flavor. I took it to a broker and he almost wept to, to be reminded of it. And it's just a change in, in the climate which makes these things which were common, now very rare, and as I'm afraid in the future, they will disappear. I'm sorry, did he just say a broker almost wept at the flavor of a tea? Look, I'll be the first to say a good cry is helpful every now and then, but the only times food should make you cry is if you eat a ghost pepper, you choke on a stringy piece of steak, or someone smashes a coconut over your head. That was Tea Craft's Nigel Melikin, and hearing just how moved he and that broker were by finding this particular flavor of tea really goes to show that not only can climate change affect tea, but it already has, and in a big way. Since all tea comes from the same plant, the flavor is largely a result of the surrounding climate. In many of these tropical regions, climate change has led to an increase in rainfall, which in turn dilutes the plant's secondary metabolites. These metabolites are the compounds that create flavor, antioxidant properties, and caffeine levels. In other words, the things tea drinkers value about their tea, and the things that distinguish one tea from another. That's what leads to situations like the one in Sri Lanka that Nigel Mel and referenced that would actually bring a broker to tears over the rediscovery of a certain flavor. And it's not just changes in rainfall. Temperature changes can lead to changed harvest dates, worsened flavor or antioxidant content, and even reduced tea yields. In fact, in a 2018 survey of tea farm workers in the Assam region of India published in the journal Environmental Science and Policy, 88% of managers of plantations and 97% of smallholders said that adverse climate conditions were a definite threat to their tea growing operations. And if that wasn't enough, climate change also spurs all the environmental issues that tea agriculture creates. Climate change threatens the health of forests, climate change leads to soil erosion, and climate change increases the prevalence of pests, which would lead farmers to start spraying more pesticides. At this rate, tea drinkers are going to stop talking about what fruit or spice it tastes like and start talking about what pesticide it tastes like. Ooh, it's a propochlor tea. I can taste the flavor of the methyl cation and a hint of chlorine as well. But beyond just the tea itself, climate change could also worsen the conditions for tea workers, who are already horrifically mistreated. Women make up 75-85% to 85 of the tea-picking workforce and face a slew of human rights violations. In India, workers only earn about $1 to $1.50 per day, and in Sri Lanka, 30% of workers live below the poverty line. On-site medical care often ranges from basic to non-existent, and there's been repeated cases of management failing to organize emergency transport to the hospital. Housing conditions for tea workers are often barrack-style, where 6 to 11 people occupy one room, often without windows, and are given very little privacy and face a higher risk of sexual harassment. And for some, there isn't even access to a working toilet, leading many to have to urinate and defecate in the actual tea bushes. Just listen to this tea plantation manager's reaction when asked about it by a BBC reporter. In fact, what they say is they defecate among the tea bushes. Is that acceptable? That is not acceptable. But there is a legal obligation to provide adequate toilet facilities. You see, you, we are proposing it and uh, slowly, slowly we'll be doing it. Uh, the, the company has asked us to within five years uh, to complete it. 
We are proposing it, and slowly we will be doing it. This is in reference to giving people a place to use the bathroom. To hear this tea plantation manager's lack of urgency, lack of accountability, and plain lack of compassion is absolutely terrifying. I'm used to hearing management say they weren't aware of an issue, or blame someone else, or argue why it isn't an issue. But hearing someone confirm the issue, and make clear they have no intention to prioritize fixing it, might just be a first for me. If other tea plantation managers are anything like this one, that's a clear indication that not only are there these human rights violations, but the people in charge don't seem to care about it. With climate change, these workers could be hit even harder. Extreme heat, which is all the more common in these tropical regions, would make working conditions even less safe. And with reduced tea quality and yields, workers are even losing their jobs. Kenya, for example, is likely to see the areas with optimal tea growing conditions shrink by about 25% and medium conditions shrink by about 40% by 2050, according to a report from the British charity Christian Aid. And if tea quality goes down, profit margins could go down with it, which would make it an even taller task for companies to improve on these human rights violations. So does this mean we should stop drinking tea and start drinking exclusively Sunny D and cream soda? Well, yes, but only because Sunny D and cream soda are the best drinks on the planet. Environmentally speaking, these issues are fixable, and they're not inherent to tea, they're just a bad part of the current system. It's like saying we have to ban Play-Doh because one kid thought it was candy. Jamie, why did you eat that? It tastes terrible, and now everyone's going to yell at Play-Doh because you can't tell the difference between a toy and a tropical starburst, you tiny idiot. One way to improve on tea agriculture is through certifications. Fair trade, which we've talked about before, actually has standards for tea. To gain the certification, farmers must join together with other farmers to become a co-op, and then their tea gets a small price bump called a fair trade premium that allows them to invest in their operation. We have a whole episode discussing some of the issues with fair trade, but ultimately, gaining a certification to demonstrate that there aren't human rights violations or major environmental concerns could not only improve the industry, but give tea drinkers some reassurance about the tea they're drinking and give farmers a reward for adopting better practices. There are also several other certification schemes at the national level, from organic certifications from the US, Japan, and the European Union, to certifications within China itself. There are certainly questions about the reliability of Chinese certification schemes, since they haven't used them to the same extent as other countries, but tea seems to be a case where China has made some progress. But certification or not, there are certainly a lot of things farmers can do to improve their operations, environmentally and economically. They can plant wall crops on vertical slopes, which can protect soil and utilize extra land. They can plant legumes, which reduces surface runoff, helps with soil nutrient depletion, and provides an extra source of revenue. They can plant trees to create shade, which would possibly improve conditions a little bit for the workers, protect tea plants from high temperatures and high rainfall, and make the tea plants feel really intimidated. They can even adopt pest control systems that rely less on pesticides. Now this is the area we practice herbicide-free integrated weed management. Periodically, we remove noxious or troublesome weeds from the system and the prevailing thick mat of innocent weeds is preventing the noxious weeds coming back. That was Mahendra Paris of the Rainforest Alliance, who works to train tea farmers on more sustainable weed control practices. And this idea of herbicide-free integrated weed management is certainly exciting. However, for the Rainforest Alliance to publicize it as they do in this video using the phrase herbicide-free could very easily mislead people. While the farmers themselves might be able to control weeds without herbicides, that still doesn't guarantee the tea won't be contaminated. Many studies have shown that it's extremely easy for pesticides from a nearby plantation to disperse and end up on the pesticide-free plants, particularly when farmers overuse them. And due to soil erosion and altered water flows as a result of climate change and monoculture, it could be even easier for pesticides to spread. That's not to say this Rainforest Alliance program wouldn't help, but if they were to call the tea that results from it herbicide-free, they'd have to either come up with solutions for all of these issues too, or otherwise make clear that there's still a decent chance for contamination.
There could also certainly be actions on the policy side. Many of the human rights violations on tea plantations are already illegal, but enforcement of those laws could be improved. And environmentally speaking, there could be education programs, market mechanisms, or even regulations to ensure better practices. Of course, any government intervention requires taxpayer money and buy-in from politicians, so one would have to compare the pros and cons of government intervention versus private governance schemes such as certifications. And look, I get that when there's so many issues and climate change threatens to worsen them all, it makes it really difficult to be optimistic. But since we absolutely can improve working conditions and rely less on monoculture, I think there's definitely a path forward. Because if we can stop using pesticides excessively, limit soil erosion and nutrient depletion, curb deforestation, adapt to climate change, and give workers the respect and security they deserve, we'll have a safer environment, stronger industry, and when a tea drinker tells a coffee drinker how much better than them they are, they could actually be correct about it. Do you wish you could slather your body in chemicals that bleach and kill coral reefs and then jump into the ocean? Then sunscreen is for you. With sunscreen, you can cover yourself in chemicals like paraben, benzophenone, cinnamate, and camphor, and simultaneously protect yourself from the sun and protect reefs from surviving. Talk about a win-win. Sunscreen. Because lying half-naked in a public place while a 10,000-degree ball of light burns your skin is totally not weird. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Yixian Soon, an assistant professor in international development at the University of Bath. Dr. Soon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ethan. It's my pleasure to be here. So you are currently working on a book project called Certifying China, The Rise and Limits of Transnational Sustainability, Governance, and Emerging Economies. Could you tell us a little bit about the book and what some of the findings are? Actually, I just submitted the final version of the manuscript to my publisher. So hopefully we can see the book by the end of this year. So I'm really excited to discuss this book. So why I started, because I'm originally from China and people are discussing about these eco labors. And um, I found this is something quite new back then. So I had a very uh, little contact with uh, these labors. I don't know what do they mean. And then we had lots of readings during our, my, I still remember my, my course, Global Environmental Politics, and the, yeah, just get to know this concept as kind of like governance. So eco-certification, eco-labeling schemes is part of global governance system but like mainly at the transnational level by businesses and NGOs. And then I try to figure out why China as a big like, consumer, but also producer countries, we haven't heard a lot in China. So I decided to, to study eco-certification in China and try to figure out whether they are present in this the largest emerging market, the, the most popular country in the world, and also who are the people trying to promote certification or trying to hinder the development of certifications. So I spent five years to study this, and it turns out to be that uh, certification is emerging in China. So those we can see this like reference alliance certification, fail trade, they are trying to also enter the Chinese market. But what is tricky that is, as we can imagine, it's not that easy to go to a new market, especially China, where you have to deal with a lot of different stakeholders that these businesses or certification organizations have little experiences, especially uh, a lot of uh, government agencies. The key finding here of this book, of my research, is that when you want to promote this new mode of governance in China, so not at the intergovernmental level, but the transnational level, in the nexus of businesses and civil society, you really have to engage with different uh, domestic stakeholders and try to find some allies 
in the country. And what is interesting is in China, you would imagine that the state takes a very strong role in controlling everything. The state itself has to be also unpacked. So what I did in my research, try to look at who are these actors in uh, the state. And some people, some organizations in this position, they are quite keen to work with transnational organizations. Where in other cases, that might be not the case. It mainly depends on their interest. And yeah, if that kind of alliance can happen, then we could see a, a lot of momentum to promote sustainable consumption or eco-certification in China. And in talking about eco-certification in China, you identified three case studies, seafood, palm oil, and tea. So why did you choose those three cases? What do they have in common with each other? It's always a very difficult question when people ask you about your case selection, I mean, if you're a social scientist. But for me, it's really about what are the like important issues. And here, what I would like to highlight, there is always a kind of mismatch between what are the salient issues in, let's say, in, in one part of the world, whereas in China, maybe this is not a salient issue. So when I started my research, I'm thinking, okay, I have to look at these um, very well-known uh, labeling schemes. And yeah, of course, I think you would think about uh, forest certification, team seafood certification. Then I started from there, and then also, we heard a lot about the destruction of rainforest due to palm oil plantations. This is something really big uh, in Europe, especially, but also I think North America these days, a lot of discussion around that. And the, the sustainable palm oil became an important topic. And then I tried to understand this and also during my field work, talk to people and realize, okay, this is uh, maybe not a very important topic in China, but still I think there is a variation there. And tea is also something quite interesting. It's, again, there is a mismatch here. We often hear a lot of debate or controversies around uh, tea productions, mainly due to the labor issues. We know a lot of news reports about child labor, for example, in tea plantations in India or some African countries. But this is not something we can hear in China. So in China, when we talk about like tea standards or certification, it's all about uh, residual of pesticides, chemical pesticides. But this is quite important for Chinese consumers and there are also a lot of uh, scandals about that. So why I started, I think I want to look at how people understand like sustainable certification. So what, what do they define as sustainability? I think T as a case give me some motivations to try to explore that as well. I found this case particularly interesting because at least in this part of the world, I think the environmental impacts of seafood and palm oil are a bit more well known, but tea isn't nearly as popular from an environmental standpoint. So looking at the eco-certifications, what issues have actually been able to be addressed with tea production? So in China, tea is more like kind of luxury product. It's not like coffee. So the cultural value of the commodity is different. So the labor issue is not that salient because people want to pay more for tea, which means the labor price is not low in the tea sector. But the problem is more about the environmental impact, the, the use of chemical pesticides and the fertilizers. And because the, the national regulation may not be that strict compared to lots, some international standards or the problem of the implementation of the national regulations. So if you look at a lot of results of the chemical residual test of different types of tea, there, there are some reports published by some NGOs like Greenpeace, and you see there is always an issue. And this is where certification has a role to play. If you can show your standards are credible and you can strictly monitor the implementation of these standards, even they are voluntary standards, then consumers would like to pay more for the tea that are certified. I think this is why a lot of people in the tea sectors, they also have a lot of hope about certification, uh, even in China. So we've talked on the podcast before in our organic and fair trade certification episode about how eco-certifications as a sustainability solution can certainly work, but they also have a lot of challenges. So with tea specifically, and with an emerging economy like China, what challenges do these eco-certifications face, and how have they addressed them? 
so the so actors in the state can play a very important role in increasing uh, the influence of private governance, also even improving the effectiveness of the relevant schemes. So we really have to think about uh, how we can uh, set some kind of arrangement or uh, government processes to make sure both a state and non-state actors can work together. And so one way is that uh, we have seen there are a lot of discussion about the rise of southern schemes, so homegrown schemes from the southern markets, and especially like driven by some government actors. So in these cases, for example, there are some domestic standards developed uh, in the tea sector in India. So in these cases, we have seen state and trying to take over the authority and then try to design standards in order to replace the standards that created by private actors. This is not necessarily a bad thing. So if you can really increase the standards, and that means uh, at the end of the day, we can have better sustainability outcomes if these standards can be well implemented. So you, you just kind of like replace private standards by public standards. But the thing is, how you can make sure that non-state actors can also participate in these processes to make sure that the transparent processes also uh, the engagement with different stakeholders. I think that's a challenge uh, to make sure the process is, is fair and uh, transparent. This is one scenario. The other one is because we would also think about the limited resources that state may have. So state may not want to or able to design their own standard or start from everything from scratch. In that case, I think this is where we see private governance can play a very important role and to collaborate with state actors. So public regulations can serve, for example, as the basis where you have still private governance as add up. But in this case, state could still use private governance as some kind of gold standards, but still this is quite uncertain, especially I think in the context of emerging markets. So we still don't know because there is also a power imbalances in this field or this world of standard setting where we have seen most standards or these certification programs, they originated from the global north. So when they try to expand their market or their influence in the global south, how they can make sure that they can also work with state actors in the other parts of the world. Tea agriculture also faces a lot of issues from climate change, which can reduce yields, increase pests, change flavor. And since these eco-certification programs are voluntary and they're not enforced, do you anticipate that private governance measures can stay strong when farmers start to face a lot of additional costs that climate change would create? Yeah, I think this is something we have to think about. And yeah, maybe that, that's on our research agenda in the future. So I think we cannot ignore the fact that climate change is affecting or has affected producers around the world. And we have to think about what kind of crops do we need and what kind of agricultural practices do we need in the age of climate change. And I think for now, certification schemes, most certification schemes, to my knowledge, really focus on sustainable practices, uh, looking at the production processes. Yeah, in terms of like new technology or, or climate friendly practices, I think this is something, this is a direction they, they need to um, work on. It's not only about producers, but also other stakeholders in the supply chain that affected by the challenge associated with climate change. And this is where a lot of uh, hope is relying on new technologies or climate-friendly practices. I think there are some pilot projects, to my knowledge, in that direction. But to incorporate these uh, new practices into the standards, I think this is still a long process. My last question for you, and you've touched on it a bit, but what do you hope for the future of eco-certifications in China? How can private governance and public governance continue to interact to support the environment? I think, as I mentioned already, it's really about the interactions between different uh, stakeholders uh, in the governance system or landscape, and especially the interaction between public or state actors and private actors or non-state actors. And in this case, in China, the boundary between state and non-state actors often are very blurred. So you don't know who are really state or non-state. So then the key question becomes, what are the interests of different 
actors and how you can find some common ground for everyone to work together. So everyone makes sure that、uh, we know this is our common goal. For example, to combat climate change,、uh, also like achieve、uh, the sustainable development goals. And here is about、uh, how. People can really understand each other and try to work together, and I think the pragmatism is important. So again, for us to think about how we can engage China, both from the Chinese perspective, so how China can engage with the world,、um, and how the world, the rest of the world, can engage with China. I think, yeah, both sides needs to be more pragmatic and try to find a strategy to work together. Dr. Soon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. This wraps up episode forty-five of the Sweaty Penguin. No new shoutouts this week, but remember, you can get a shoutout by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict. That helps us boost in their algorithms. You can also get a shoutout by joining our Patreon, and not just a shoutout, but merch, bonus content, even a chance to win a signed book from one of our experts. Head to Patreon.com/slash/TheSweatyPenguin to unlock all that cool stuff and help grow the show. Once again, the Sweaty Penguin. Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org/perilandpromise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. Today's episode was written by Olivia Amate and Ethan Brown, edited by Frank Hernandez, and produced by Ethan Brown, Shannon Damiano, Frank Hernandez, and Caroline Kale. Our ads were voiced by Lindsay Cronin, and our music was composed by Brett Saka. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownies Central. Clips today came from Mackenzie Marie, CBC News, Northwest Tea Festival, BBC News, and Rainforest Alliance.